I encourage you to keep your Bible open at um, that Galatians passage. Uh, welcome to those on live stream who don't know me. My name's Rick. I'm one of the pastors here. It is good to be able to unpack God's Word together. Uh, we get to the end of the book of Galatians this morning and some of you will cheer. There's less going to be less talking about circumcision in the next couple of weeks. Paul has been dictating this letter to a whole pile of people in the churches of Galatia, a region in what we would call Turkey today. But at the moment, he grabs the pen or the typewriter or his laptop and he starts writing himself, although it couldn't be the typewriter and the laptop, could it? Because he couldn't write himself. Why did he don't do that? Probably just so people knew that he wrote the letter. You know, there's been forgeries around for a long time. There's been people pretending that they are not the people they really are and writing letters in other people's names for, you know, a long time. It's not just a modern idea. And Paul wants people to know that he is the one writing this letter to the churches in Galatia. And you can understand, given what's in the content of the letter, couldn't you? It's important that the churches in Galatia know that this is not a forgery written by a fake Paul. But this is written by him because he says some pretty tough things. Let's pray that as we get to the end of this letter, we don't treat it like the credits on a movie. You know, that's when you get up and go because it's just the rubbish at the end. Just, you know, it's, this is more like a Marvel movie where there's actually something exciting other than credits. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, in your goodness, may your word speak to us this morning as it keeps doing. May you keep transforming us and may we have the courage to trust you, even if it costs us. We ask this, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Well, you need to turn your Bibles open, so I'm going to open up mine. So it's Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. That's page 1700. And 74. We've been in Galatians such a long time now, 12 weeks, that it almost all opens automatically, doesn't it? It's great. When it comes to the God stuff in your life, what's really important? What is it that's going to capture your attention? Or maybe I could put it this way. Imagine you're going to get home this afternoon, not because I've preached for so long, but because you got home and after church you hung around and did stuff and yarned to people, but it was this afternoon when you got home, and someone who you're desperate to know Jesus, someone in your life that you are desperate to, for them to know Jesus, says, I want to find out about this Christianity stuff. What is it that you'd share with them? One thing, just one thing, you're only allowed one thing. What is it that you'd share with them? For those who opposed Paul in the churches of Galatia, what seemed to matter to them is whether or not their external appearances had been adjusted. They had adjusted their external appearances, we read in this passage, just so they could reduce the opposition that they faced. And we'll find out more about that because we read Acts 14, didn't we? And the opposition was real. And remember that Acts 14 passage, Paul is speaking the gospel, some Jews get converted, some Jews get really cranky and they are not happy at all, Gentiles are converted and Gentiles are not happy at all and in, as a result there's riots, <coughs> murder plots, beatings, stonings and uh, as Paul goes down to Lystra, they chase him down to Lystra, um, they rev up the crowd Paul is stoned and I don't mean he smoked something he shouldn't have done, he got rocks that thrown at him and he was dragged out the, outside the city of Lystra and led, left for dead. You see the opposition to the gospel is real, always has been and it seems like uh, the false teachers as part of their motivation to change the gospel is to, is to reduce the persecution that they face. And so they changed the gospel and then they compelled people to get circumcised because, well, if you got circumcised, it would reduce a significant amount of hostility. I guess they hoped that this gospel that said, you're saved by faith in Jesus only, plus you need to get circumcised, they would have hoped that that would have meant that a whole pile of people were no longer upset with what they said. And as we read from Acts 14, 
there were a lot of people upset with the gospel, weren't there? Now, Paul makes it very clear in this gospel, in, the, in this letter to the Galatian churches, that anything you do to change the gospel means that you don't have a gospel. You've got no gospel at all, he says in chapter 1. He's made it very clear all the way through and there's big implications of having no gospel at all. You don't have Jesus plus baptism and end up with just a better person. You have no salvation when you have Jesus plus anything. Paul is concerned about their, this false gospel because he's concerned about the people. He's personally connected with them. He's concerned about their eternity. And because he's concerned about their eternity, he's not trying just to please them and win a fan club. He doesn't want to tell them what their itching ears want to hear. He wants them to know the truth. And we read back in chapter 4 verse 16 that Paul wishes that he could have been there. Chapter 4 verse 16 uh, I've told you the truth and then, then, then he says actually uh, verse 20 I wish I could be with you now I wish I could change my tone I'm perplexed about you lot he wishes that he c- could be there because he cares for them and letters never seem to be as good as a person there do they sometimes well that's what we feel but Paul can't just hop on a flight he can't zoom call them He's written them a letter. This is so important that that it can't wait. People's eternity is on the line. He's concerned about the truth. He's not concerned what they think of him. And as Paul concludes this letter, he reminds the churches in Galatia that his concern for them is the exact opposite of the false teachers. They just want to be keeping up the right appearances. Reduce the opposition. They don't seem concerned about the churches that are going to follow this false gospel. They're concerned about themselves. Uh, In our own diocese, when we have a false teacher in a congregation, the congregation is infected like a whole dough is infected by yeast. Uh, infected with the false teaching of a false leader, what do you think that does to the people's eternity? The false teachers of Galatia have reduced following God to be nothing more than keeping up the right appearances. And they've even deluded themselves. Sure, you can get out a knife and chop off a bit, But actually, when it comes to keeping the Old Testament law, none of you, none of them do it. They claim to follow the Old Testament law. Circumcision is the thing the knife did. But they don't even get close to keeping the Old Testament law themselves. Which brings us to the real matter from Paul's perspective... He's concerned, verse 14, he's concerned about the cross of Christ. And his concern for the cross of Christ has meant that his body has also been disfigured. It's got scars. Because his concern for people to hear the gospel means that he's prepared to put everything on the line so that people hear it. We read about that in Acts 14, didn't we? And we could have read from 2 Corinthians 11 when Paul has a greater detail of what he's been through for the sake of the gospel. So what does Paul mean when he says that he's concerned only for the cross of Christ? So far in the book of Galatians, he's talked about that the gospel, uh, the, the thing we receive from God is that we have been made just as if we'd never sinned, that is justified, through faith in Jesus. And here he talks about being 
concerned for the cross of Christ. There's just really two ways of talking about the same thing. Let me show you how it's all connected. Jesus' death on the cross paid for the debt of sin and wiped away the guilt of our sin, turning aside the Father's wrath so that you and I can stand before the throne of grace with confidence. The language that Galatians uses is that it freed, it from the, freed us from the curse of sin that is revealed in us by the law, the Old Testament law. And the work of Jesus on the cross has fulfilled the promises of God and won for us the inheritance of eternal life. If you put your faith in Jesus to justify you, make you just as if you'd never sinned, you are given a free gift, an undeserved gift, the gift of eternal life. And letting people know of this good news what God has won for us through the work of Jesus on the cross is Paul's absolute focus. If he was to get home this afternoon and the person that he cared for most asked him, what is this Christianity rubbish all about? He would be concerned for the cross of Christ. That's what drives him. That is what he boasts about. It is what he focuses time on. It's what consumes his effort and it's what's given him scars. In verse 14, Paul goes on to tell us that it's through the cross of Christ that the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And it's worthwhile reflecting on what he means by there. He's not gone and become a hermit in a hermit kingdom. In, verse, in, in chapter 6, verse 7, Paul says, you reap what you sow. We looked at that last week, didn't we? And you'll never, you'll never have success in putting to death sin in your life when you make no effort to crucify it, when the thing that's causing you to sin you keep by your side so you can reference it and indulge it when you feel like. Crucifying something is extreme, isn't it? It's killing it, putting it to death, not sidelining it. Paul wants them to get rid of sin completely. Crucify them. What is it you're struggling with? Have you, have you thought about crucifying the thing you're struggling with in this last week? And Paul's focus on the cross of Christ means that he is no longer looking to the world for his fulfilment. No longer looking to the world for his purposes. He already lives in the world. He's not become a hermit, as I said. But that's not what drives me. That's not what I live for. I, have si I'm not, I haven't just put things on the side, the things of the world on the side. I've crucified them. He lives for a higher purpose. Whereas the false teachers, what are they doing? They're keeping all their options open to avoid any persecution. They like the comfortable life and they're prepared to negotiate the gospel to keep the comfortable life. And when they negotiate the gospel to keep the comfortable life, they lose their eternity. They're prepared to gamble that. Paul makes it very clear that to grasp hold of or to be concerned by the cross of Christ is not going to mean that life is a walk in the park. It's not about being relaxed and trouble-free. Trouble awaits those who follow Jesus. I wonder whether you realise that. Paul himself bears the scars because he follows Jesus. It's not just a slight turmoil and a couple of people who shame you or cancel you. The churches in Galatia need to make a decision. Who will they follow? What gospel will they grasp hold of? The people in Galatia have reached a fork in the road where, where it's not just two roads that lead to Rome, if I could use that expression, but two roads that lead in completely different directions. And one fork with the false teachers, with the desire to impress, with the desire to keep people on your side, will mean that you lose your eternity. You'll put aside 
you'll put aside the things that Jesus has done and add to it the things that you've got to do to keep people happy. You'll reduce your persecution, you'll avoid the conflict that will come if you hold to the truth, but you'll lose your eternity. And on the other fork, that this is the gospel that Paul first handed down, the gospel that was first preached, about faith in Jesus Christ alone, faith in Jesus alone to deal with the curse of sin, to wipe away your guilt, to pay your debt, to restore your relationship with God. That's the real gospel. That will result in conflict and persecution because people will not like it. There you go, there's the choice, Galatia. There you go, there's the choice, people at Tea Tree Gully Anglican at the 10 o'clock service. There's your choice. Choose which way you're going. That's how Paul puts it. Need to make a choice. So what do we do with that? Well, if I haven't already raised some things, there are for you to think about. Here's some more. It would be good for you to, you to ask yourself what you're doing with that choice. Do you really have a gospel concern? Yes, we're a gospel church, aren't we? You come along, you do your bit, you give your money. Do you have a gospel concern? I'm not asking about doing your bit and giving your money. Do we have that as a church? Do we have a gospel concern? Do you have a gospel concern as individuals in this church? Let me ask us some questions to reveal whether or not we give lip service to the gospel concern or whether we really have it. What were you going to share with your family member, your best friend, the person you've been praying with when you get home this afternoon and they ask you, what is this Christianity stuff all about? Do you have a clarity to the gospel? Can you communicate that clarity in our modern world? What do I mean by that? Well, no one knows what the word justified means, so don't use that one. That's what I mean. I don't mean what if you adjusted so the modern world likes it. I'm just saying are you going to use language the modern world understands? Are you, do you know the gospel clearly? The gospel that was first passed on by the apostles or are you tempted to do what so many people are tempted to do and have a Jesus plus gospel a Jesus plus baptism gospel a Jesus plus communion gospel a Jesus plus the healthy eating gospel a Jesus plus the moral living gospel a Jesus plus the Sabbath law keeping gospel the Jesus plus tithing gospel which one do you want to grab because I can guarantee you now that you can go and find a church anywhere in Adelaide that will teach you any gospel you want to hear. So which one are you going to? You can go and find the church or the church leader that will tell you what your rich ears want to hear. And so it's important to know that you have a biblical clarity to the gospel, not an itching ears clarity to the gospel. I'm the same as you, by the way. What was it you were going to say to your close friend when you got home from church this afternoon and they said to you, what is this Jesus all about? Would have you added a Jesus plus gospel? When it comes to the gospel, here's another question for us to think about. Do we have such a gospel concern in our lives that it means that we sow actions in our lives to please the Spirit, using the language of last week's passage. Are you sowing to please your, the Spirit? Or are you just making those superficial changes, the external stuff that is just there so you avoid any opposition? Are you keeping your options open in case you want to indulge yourself again at a later date? Uh, it's not a, new, not a new problem that we all face, not just you. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, the Lord says, The people come near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they've been taught. Here's 
How has your heart changed? So that the gospel concern that you have is being reflected at your inner core. Or are you just reduced this Jesus following stuff to the external actions only? And then without falling into the trap of legalism, because it's so easy to do this, isn't it? If you'd taped your prayers and your conversations over this last week, uh, where's your gospel concern shown? That's worthwhile thinking through, isn't it? Do you have a gospel concern? Are you consumed for the gospel the same way Paul is? I think we need to keep, even in ministry, I need to keep making sure I have a gospel concern because it's so easy just to fall into doing the ministry things that the people around me like. I'm aware that each one of these questions gives us lots to think about and so I printed them. They're in the newsletter. If you're going to really deal with them, you probably need to have the newsletter open and to be in a quiet space, although if you've got young kids that will never happen. And at least do some praying and reflecting on those questions in your life. The second way I think this passage, this book, challenges us is that when we have a gospel concern in our lives, we should expect gospel persecution. There is a gospel cost. We live in a society that is quite happy for any church that says, believe anything you want, we're all going to heaven anyhow. The universal salvation gospel. We're in a society and we have hearts around us, just like ours, that likes the idea of everyone gets to heaven as long as they love people, as long as we don't define what that love really means. The undefined love gospel. We're in a society that loves the great indulgence gospel. God will bless you with everything your heart desires. You can splurge on yourself and that's a sign of your godliness. We're in a society, and we have hearts, by the way, that like this as well, that talk about the promote myself, be focused on myself, have no boundaries in living gospel. They're good ones, aren't they? Because when I have those sorts of gospels, I really don't need to know anything. I just do whatever I want. They are no gospels at all. What about the gospel of the seven sacraments one? That when you've jumped the seven hurdles that the church has given you, then you're in. That's easy. You see, the gospel of Jesus, faith in Jesus Christ alone, does not allow for any of those other gospels. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And when you speak against false gospels that are all around us, people don't always like that. In fact, there are people here today that have tried to speak into the lives of their friends and family. People who are deeply religious and very nice and tried to point out that the gospel that they are preaching is not the gospel of the Bible. The saved once you're baptised gospel is not the gospel of the Bible. Saved once you're confirmed gospel is not the gospel of the Bible. Saved once you've adopted the Old Testament law faithfully gospel is not the gospel of the Bible. And when people in our church today have tried to speak into the lives of their friends, their friends have reacted strongly against it. Nice friends, religious people, regular at church, but opposed to the biblical gospel. Not the Rick Gospel and not the Anglican Gospel, opposed to the Gospel as first preached. Persecution varies depending where you are and who your opposition is. But Paul also says to us that when you preach this Gospel, the Gospel cost will be this, that people will not like it. We like a culture that likes us. 
But I think if you're going to hold on to the biblical gospel, you should not expect society to allow you to pursue any career you want. You will get cancelled. But don't get cancelled because you're a jerk. Don't get cancelled because you rammed, rammed morality up people's noses when they didn't want it. Get cancelled because you shared the good news of Jesus in a way that people can hear and understand. Get cancelled because you've lived out the gospel in your life, not expected non-Christians to live it, but lived out the gospel in your life as you put to death your own desires of the flesh, your own desires of the flesh. Persecution will come as you speak the gospel in a loving way. Persecution will come as you keep in step with the Spirit in the way that you live. Expect it. But it's only been light so far, hasn't it? In other words, none of us have been persecuted to the point of shedding blood, unless you tripped up over on the way home after having a bad day at work. Don't ram it down people's throats. Pray for them. Give a reason for the hope you have. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Give a reason for the hope you have. That assumes that people are asking. Do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. But make sure you speak the gospel and not your own version of the Jesus plus gospel that you wish everyone could hear. But let me guarantee you that even when you've prayed and shared the gospel with gentleness and respect to those that are asking, that does not mean that people will like it. There's a bloke called John Stott, he's dead now. Um, I didn't have anything to do with his death in case you're wondering. Um, and he says, so he, in other words he lived a while ago in a culture that was far more open to Christianity and he says about the gospel that none of us, himself, ourselves, myself included, when we hear the gospel will like it because with Jesus hanging on the cross, he is saying, I am here because of you. These are John's words. It is your sin I'm bearing. It is your curse I'm suffering. It is your debt I'm paying. It's your death I'm dying. No one likes that, do they? Nothing in history, no one in history or in the universe can cut you down to being so wretched as the gospel. As John says, it's when you visit a place called Calvary, there your inflated view of yourself is cut down to size. Now we live, and this is not John's words now, we live in a therapeutic age, don't we? An age when everyone likes to feel good about life. And we like to feel good about life. And the gospel says that I am cursed by sin. That I should not feel good about life. But there is good news when you realise what Jesus has done for you. People won't like that. They didn't in Galatia and they don't in Australia. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we keep thanking you for the goodness of this gospel. And it's so tempting for us to have a Jesus plus gospel, Jesus plus moral living and Jesus plus this and Jesus plus that. And we, we don't like to speak against people who have a Jesus plus gospel and so we don't because we, we like to keep everything calm and gentle. And yet a Jesus plus gospel is no gospel at all. And the people who grasp onto it and believe it have no hope at all. Lord, help us to be concerned about the cross of Christ in the way that Paul was. Help us to proclaim the gospel of faith or justification in Jesus Christ alone, like Paul did. And we pray, Lord God, that your spirit will transform the lives of the people who hear it, like you did with us. And we also ask, Lord God, that we will not confuse the, the gospel living 
and the gospel proclamation that we'll actually understand that you save people whilst we were still sinners. Lord, work in us and through us to your glory. Enable us to grasp hold of this good gospel, even if it means that life goes pear-shaped and gets hard. We ask this, Lord, in your precious name. Amen.